Feeding our brain is obviously essential to keeping it healthy, but how best to nourish it is not that simple. So all this season on Healing Quest, we're going to bring you expert advice on that topic from Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez. He made the concept of food as medicine the cornerstone of his practice in New York City. And I must say, I was surprised when he told me about his view of the single most important thing he says we can all do to nourish our brains. The single most important thing you can do for your brain, and probably the least promoted, is to drink enough water. And the reason that's why, why that's so important, most body cells are 75% water. Brain cells are 85% water. Most of us don't drink water. Most of us drink teas, coffee, herbal teas, which are actually diuretic. For every 10 ounces of coffee that you drink or 10 ounces of a energy drink you drink, you actually lose 12 ounces of fluid. So the American craze with bottled and canned synthetic energy drinks and even herbal teas will cause you to lose water. And the first organ that's affected is the brain. What's enough water? Eight to 10 glasses a day, which very few of us do. And that's got to be plain water. Not coffee, not tea, not herbal tea, not juice. You want clean water. Yeah, mountain spring water is what we should all be drinking. Filtered water is second best. I personally use reverse osmosis. Along with water, Dr. Gonzalez told me that nourishing our brain requires paying attention to the most commonly used seasoning in the American diet. Physiologists have known this for 80 years. You need salt in order to transmit nerve impulses. Your brain cannot work without salt. Salt has been demonized for the last 50 years. Wrong. There, unfortunately, there are new studies out of conventional literature showing salt isn't the great enemy of mankind. It really doesn't cause high, high blood pressure. It really isn't a toxic poison. Remember, they worry about salt. Salt's an essential mineral. Of course, it should be a good quality salt. Mine salt, the salt from Utah, the pure salt, or I like Celtic or Celtic salt, however it's pronounced. It's got 80 different minerals in it. So real unrefined sea salt has 50 to 80 minerals in addition to sodium chloride. The purified salt that you get in the store in the supermarket has just been purified. And they also add aluminum to it because it makes it go through the machinery easier. And they add sugar to salt. The thinking of the industry is that people are so addicted to sugar that if you put sugar in salt, they'll use more salt. So no, it should not be the, you know, the regular store brands. Get a good quality sea salt with all the minerals. Salt is one of the essentials of life, but in recent years, it's been the subject of some heated debate. It's been linked to health problems and been the target of campaigns to restrict its use. That approach, of course, has sparked some other views. Mm, so we consulted our own experts to get a better understanding of not only how much, but what kind of salt is best for us. Frank King is a naturopathic physician and an expert on homeopathy and natural medicine. Sally Fallon Morell is president of a national foundation focused on improving America's diet by eliminating chemicals and other processing from our food. And Selena Delangre is CEO of a firm that for three decades has been scouring the globe for natural, unprocessed salt. When you know, we get certain people promoting, oh, you should not have salt, what they're really saying is you should not have refined salt. The best salt is unrefined salt that still has all the trace minerals and the magnesium in it. Sea salt has a naturally occurring potassium, magnesium, and, and uh, calcium. And our body fluid is made up the same thing. Refined salt is um, actually foreign to the body. These uh, additives they put into refined salt where they strip it down to sodium chloride only, then, and then they add a few things in there just for aesthetics. When they put iodine in salt, it causes the salt to turn a little bit of a purplish color, so they bleach it. And then the bleach makes it a little bitter, so they put dextrose in it so it tastes better. People think that it's pure white salt is what is, you know, better for them. It's been refined. It's been, you know, and this is not the case. You really want unrefined salt. So look at the color. The color should be gray, pink, or beige. That, and then you know that it is unrefined. There was a Dr. Lynn August from Health Equations that wrote an article for my newsletter. She said that 80% uh, of the patients that came in when she did their blood work were sodium deficient. And I'm very concerned about these uh, synthetic salts that stimulate the salt taste bud but don't satisfy a requirement for salt. I think that will lead to a huge increase in obesity because people just eat and eat to get the salt they need. The body keeps saying, I need salt, I need salt. And you may be tasting a taste of salt, but you're not getting salt. So you, you're, you will never feel satisfied with your food. Salt is an essential component for a healthy and prosperous life. And we gotta look at things in the natural state 
be able to find what's going to create that natural state in us. So as with so many other items, it's very important to know how much your salt has been chemically processed. If you'd like to know more information on this topic, we have the links for you at HealingQuest.tv. Nutrition is a key ingredient in keeping our brains healthy. So in every episode of Healing Quest this season, we'll be bringing you expert advice on the best in brain foods. Our source is Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, a nutritional therapy expert, and his topic today is dairy. And as you'll see, he has some very strong opinions on this subject. Dairy has been demonized too. You know, the anti-cholesterol fanatics have dominated academic thinking in, this, in the U.S. for the last 50 years in the Western European world. You know, it should be low fat. You know, God put the fat there for a reason. The fat is all the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. They find them in the fat portion of the milk. Take away the fat, you're taking away all the essential nutrients. And I, I challenge anyone out there to tell me skim milk tastes good. It tastes like wa white water. Whole milk has all, you know, has all the nutrients that are meant to be there that sustain life. Now, of course, there's milk and there's milk. Pasteurized milk is heated to 230 degrees. Guess what? The enzymes in milk are destroyed above 117 degrees. When you heat anything to 230 degrees, you're basically sterilizing it. And it absolutely is useless. So milk should be horror of horrors. Yeah, what I'm about to say, raw milk. Raw milk is not allowed in most states, but you can get it usually if you join a buyer's club. So the milk should be raw from grass-fed cows. You want a cow that's out there having fun on the range, eating grass, that's what they should eat. Grass-fed cows produce good quality milk with lots of nutrition. Feedlot animals, and a lot of dairy now feedlot based, where they're feeding them grains and synthetic junk and waste products and chicken feet and that kind of junk. Cows, a good legitimate cow is never gonna eat chicken feet. They're gonna eat grass, but are the, the cows raised in industrial farms and industrial farming situations are fed all this waste junk. And of course, I wouldn't want to drink that raw milk. It's not safe. But milk from a grass-fed cow handled properly by a farmer that really cares about it is gonna be perfectly safe. I just thinking about cheese and butter and the other two. Well, fortunately, cheese, raw cheese is available in the supermarket retail market because you know, it's fermented, so the FDA, thank you for, the, for allowing that to be available, does allow it to be available. Not milk, per se, in most states, but raw, uh, raw cheese is available. And, of course, a lot of European cheeses are raw. They're smarter than we are. They don't want to pasteurize. This fanaticism of that, you've got to kill all the, the germs in food. You know, it's ridiculous. Butter was demonized, like most dairy products. Butter is an essential food. It's like coconut oil. It's got essential fats that the brain needs, that we need. It's a wonderful food. And it also gives taste to food. You know, they talk about the French paradox. The French eat huge amounts of butter, and they have one quarter the amount of heart disease that we do. They eat things like pate, which is pure fat, and organ meats like liver pate. And they just, you know, they, they thrive on that stuff, and they have very little uh, heart disease though, compared to what we've had traditionally. So it's not the butter. Butter is a good food. The, the saturated fats in butter are really important. Saturated fat is not the enemy. We really need saturated fats for a lot of reasons, including brain function. We're going back to that. Butter, to me, is a brain food. It's got those wonderful saturated fats. When you think about the brain, I know I'm repeating myself. I've got to remember it's 60% fat. Some of them are unsaturated, but a lot of it's saturated. Butter, like coconut oil, has the right proportions and the right mix of saturated fats that really help feed the brain. So every time you, you eat a piece of butter, think of, think of your IQ going up two or three points. Sounds good to me, because I, I think everything's better with butter. Especially your IQ, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, what Dr. Gonzalez was talking about, what he felt so passionately about, is the concept that not all fats are bad. As a matter of fact, we need to welcome mm -hmm. the good fats, like the fats from grass-fed milk, cheese and butter, into our diets. In fact, we heard the very same thing from our certified natural chef, Carla DeLongre, when we asked her to whip up a healthy breakfast for us. This morning, we're going to be doing some bloomin' eggs. This is a recipe that actually uses bell peppers as the flower petals, and it makes it look like it's a beautiful little flower for your breakfast. And we're also gonna do a side of bacon. Now, um, breakfast has a lot of controversy around the topic. A lot of people think, oh, I should stay away from bacon, I should stay away from eggs, the cholesterol, the fat. Well, I'm gonna talk about how this is actually a really healthy breakfast. This is free-range grass-fed bacon, which this makes all the difference of making healthy fat or bad fat. So we got our pan nice and hot, and we're gonna add our bacon here. And then we're going to get our pan nice and hot for our eggs. I like to use raw butter. This is um, grass-fed 
uh, raw butter. Raw butter actually has all the fats that you need. Um, it helps with the brain function, it helps with mental clarity, it actually even helps with the, the um, lubrication in your joints. We're gonna do a nice large slab of this to make sure that we don't let our eggs stick to the pan. You can also use ghee. Ghee is a really amazing ingredient. It's actually clarified butter. It's a really, really amazing um, thing to use for high heat recipes. So while that's heating up, I'm gonna get my flower petals ready, which are my bell peppers. And you cut them in rings, about half an inch thick. We're gonna add a ring of our bell pepper. Make sure it's nice and hot. You want it nice and hot so that the egg stays within the ring and also so that um, the egg doesn't absorb the butter and stick to the pan. This is nice and hot. We're gonna add this to it. I like to add it, um, put the egg first in a ramekin or a cup. That way you, you have a little bit more control. You don't break the yolk. Now a lot of people think that you should only have egg whites because they're concerned about the cholesterol. Well, the egg yolk actually has choline in it and choline is a really amazing um, benefit to the liver. It's actually one of the only um, elements in nature that helps to cleanse the liver. There we go. Now what I like to do is I add a little bit of Celtic sea salt. So we have that in there and now we're going to steam, almost poach our eggs. And I turn the heat off and let that just simmer because the bottom is going to get just slightly crispy while the top gets nice and steamed and then the, the yolk still maintains it's a little bit of a runniness. Healthy fats are really really important for brain function. It's really good for your lubricants of your joints. Um, it actually helps to sustain the collagen in your skin as well so it's almost like an anti-aging. I really think that it's extremely important to to keep fats in your diet. This low fat craze is actually really dangerous. They've seen a lot of different things in the U.S. where they've, they've decreased the fat in our diets, yet obesity is at an all-time high. So really, it's not about the fat. It's actually about the good fat. Um, it's about your sourcing, where you're getting your fat. So there you have it. These are the bloomin' eggs. It's one of my favorite dishes. There you go. Add a couple slices of bacon to it. Garnish with a little bit of fresh fruit. Bloomin' eggs. So it turns out that the right kind of bacon and eggs can really be health food. And Carla says don't forget that bacon isn't the only source of meat for a healthy breakfast. Well, she says remember sausages, patties, and breakfast links as well, as long as they come from grass-fed, pasture-raised sources. This season on Healing Quest, our nutrition segments are focused on brain food. What we can do to most effectively nourish this most important part of our body. Our source for this advice is Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, a renowned nutritional therapy expert. Now his topic today is nuts, three kinds that are especially valuable, not only as brain food, but also for our heart and our liver. Walnuts specifically help lower cholesterol, help heart function. They also have the omega-3s too. All the nuts will have varying proportions, varying amounts, depending on the nut, of, these essential, of the essential omega-3 precursor, alpha-linolenic acid, which in the body can be converted into EPA and DHA. So it's the plant source of the omega-3 essential fatty acids. They are particularly richly found in nuts and seeds, particularly in nuts. So that's why all nuts are valuable. Now, walnuts are specifically important because of the proportion of fatty acids seems to help the heart, has been proven to lower cholesterol, and helps reverse atherosclerosis. I like Brazil nuts because they have a particularly high level of selenium, which helps produce glutathione in the body, which is the liver's main detoxifying molecule, but also uh, selenium helps fight cancer. That's been documented in many studies, epidemiological studies, clinical studies, prospective studies. So selenium, very essential, and Brazil nuts are one of the richest sources of selenium of any food on earth. We have a particular proclivity to almonds. We happen to like almonds in our practice. Raw almond butter also. Almonds help fight, they're not miraculous, and that's not all we use, of course, but they help fight cancer, but they also help the brain. The reason they help the brain, they have, of course, they have lots of minerals, yes, but they have the omega-3 alpha-linolenic acid precursor, which really is necessary for normal brain function. And Dr. Gonzalez says we can get even more nutritional benefit from nuts if we soak them before serving them. All foods have n valuable nutrients, but that most foods also have anti-nutrients. Nuts particularly have 
anti-nutrients, particularly enzyme blockers. They block like pancreatic enzymes. And if you soak them, interestingly enough, you preserve the nutritional value, but you knock out the anti-nutrients and the anti-enzyme blockers. This is not the first time we've heard about the benefits of soaking nuts and grains. Two seasons ago, author and nutritional therapy practitioner Margaret Floyd gave us details on why traditional societies have been soaking nuts and grains for centuries to make them easier to digest. If you think about the purpose of this little grain, it's not necessarily to feed us, it's to grow another plant. And so it doesn't want to break down prematurely. And so it has all these protective mechanisms. It has, uh, we call them anti-nutrients, so things like enzyme inhibitors or something called phytic acid. And um, unless we deal with those, it becomes very difficult for our body to actually break down the grain when we eat it. And it actually leaches a lot of minerals and important nutrients from our body in that process. So we're going to trick the seed into thinking that it's about to grow another plant by soaking it. Okay, let's get back to tricking walnuts, as Margaret would say, to make sure we get the most out of the brain food benefits in them. So first of all, all you have to do is soak them in a bowl of water overnight. Then drain the nuts, put them on a cookie sheet, season them with sea salt, and put them in the oven at a very low temperature, maybe 200 degrees. I know a lot about this. Then you let them roast for five or six hours, take them out of the oven, and then, here's my big tip to you, after you take them out of the oven, hide a bunch because if anybody else is around, they're gonna disappear so fast you won't believe it. Now, I'm not saying not to share them. I just wanna make sure you get to enjoy them before they're all gone, and I'm speaking here from personal experience. You know, sharing is a good thing. <laughs> well, it's right up there with giving, and it's anything for our viewers here on Healing Quest. When it comes to brain food, fish are high on the list for most nutritionists, with a couple of caveats. So I asked our nutritional expert to help us understand what to look for and what to look out for when we think about fish as the main course for dinner. The reason fish has been promoted for decades as a good brain food, it has the essential omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHEA, cosapentaenoic acid, to cosahexaenoic acid, which, like the saturated fats from coconut oil, are absolutely essential for normal brain function. Brain cells are very complicated, and they need a whole variety of fats, both saturated and unsaturated. The omega-3 fatty acids are what we call unsaturated fatty acids. The saturated fats from um, coconut oil are a different category of, of fats altogether, but the brain needs them all. And DHA particularly is necessary for brain development in utero when we're little embryos, also when we're young you know, babies. Our brain grows very quickly the first two years of life, and it really needs DHA and some, to some extent EPA. So it's very important for mothers and fathers to give their kids, their young kids, make fish or make sure they're getting DHA and EPA. Now one of the problems with fish, of course, is the mercury issue. Fish live in the ocean. We're dumping you know, millions of tons of junk into the ocean, and it accumulates. And there's a lot of mercury in the ocean, and particularly the bigger predatory fishes like tuna and swordfish, which used to be my favorite, are loaded with mercury. Mercury is a brain toxin that can lead to multiple sclerosis and in Parkinson's and other neuro neurodegenerative brain diseases. So with fish, you have to be careful. You always want wild fish as a start, and you want the smaller fishes like salmon, not the big huge fishes like swordfish and tuna, as delicious as those things are. They accumulate mercury. The bigger the fish and the higher on the food chain, the more it accumulates mercury. And there are other, of course, toxins in the sea. Now, I like my fish from a group of Alaskan fishermen that got together and they ship frozen fish from Alaska. They'll ship it anywhere in the U.S. Again, I know the owner, but I have no vested interest. I recommend them because they do a great job. They check their stuff. It's clean. It doesn't have any radiation poisoning coming in from Japan. They've checked all that. So you can often get wild fish locally from Alaska in your, in your local um, supermarket or a whole food shop, for example. But these people in Alaska will ship legitimate, authentic, freshly caught, froze, freshly frozen fish from Alaska anywhere in the country. So it has to be clean fish. You don't want the huge fishes like swordfish and tuna. Salmon's great. It's loaded with, again, if it's wild salmon, it will be loaded with the essential omega-3s, the EPA and DHA, which are necessary for normal brain function. And of course, wild salmon is also especially good for cardiovascular health, as well as brain health. To learn more about the Alaskan group Dr. Gonzalez mentioned, we have a link for you at HealingQuest.tv. And if you'd like to learn how to cook wild salmon, we're pleased to have noted chef Rebecca Katz with us today to show you how to do that. Rebecca is the author of One Bite at a Time, which uses wild-caught salmon as a frequent ingredient, as does The Cancer-Fighting Kitchen, her latest book.
So today, I'm taking this piece of salmon and I'm going a little Asian with it. So I've got some lime juice. This is gonna be a miso ginger lime glazed salmon. So I've got some lime juice here and I've got a little bit of sesame oil, just a little bit of toasted sesame oil here. And um, I have some white miso and I love using miso and fish. Miso has that umami flavor. It's that savory, what is it that tastes so good flavor to it. And I'm gonna add that to my bowl. And I'm using um, some sweet rice wine called mirin. And if you don't have mirin, you could use just a little bit of um, organic grade B maple syrup, okay? Just, this makes this a little sweet and sour. And I'm just gonna take my whisk and I'm just breaking this miso up a little bit. So I'm just whisking it till I get all the lumps out, which I've done. And now here's one of my secret little kitchen tricks. I love this. So here's my ginger. I've just cut it like that and this is my little handy dandy microplaner, which I love. I use it for everything. I use it for zesting. So I'm taking my ginger and I'm just rubbing it against the microplane. And look what's happened. It's right there. Tap, tap in my bowl. How easy is that? Another little whisk. And now I'm just gonna Pour the miso ginger glaze over my salmon and I'm going to put it in the oven at 400 degrees for four to five minutes. This is not the time to go like zoom out, walk your dog, come back. You know, this isn't like braising. This is like a fast roasted salmon. So pay attention. I'm going to put it in the oven. So now I'm gonna check my salmon because I don't wanna be arrested by the salmon police for overcooking. So it's always safe to check just like a minute before you think it's gonna be done. And you want it to be nice and kind of like red, reddish pink in the middle. And that's your cue that your salmon is ready to be taken out of the oven. It's done. So here I am back with my miso ginger lime wild Alaskan salmon. And I have it on a bed of forbidden rice with a little bit of arugula. I'm just gonna put a little bit of this miso glaze over it. And I'm happy to say that I have not been arrested by the salmon police, that I did pull the salmon out at the right time so it's nice and flaky inside. And if I can do it, you can do it. Okay, so this delicious dish is good for our brain and good for our heart, and now we have new research that says omega-3s in wild salmon can help prevent premature aging. Sounds like a superfood to me. If you'd like Rebecca's recipe, we have that for you at HealingQuest.tv. When it comes to mealtime favorites, I don't think potassium and magnesium would be on the list for most of us. But that's why we have nutritional experts like Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez to enlighten us. He says those two minerals are very important when it comes to keeping our brain healthy. And the good news is that they're very easy to include as a regular part of our daily diet. The potassium, potassium is such an important mineral. And you know, if you're taking salt, you also need potassium and magnesium. Potassium, of course, is found in a lot of fruits, like bananas have 300 milligrams of potassium. You know, there are nine trillion brain cells, and they communicate through electrical transmission, which requires salt, but also requires potassium. And bananas are loaded with oranges, are loaded citrus, loaded with potassium, grapefruits, oranges. Leafy greens loaded with potassium. Virtually any vegetable, even something like broccoli or potatoes, which we don't think is a good source of potassium, loaded with potassium. 
But bananas, of course, traditionally the richest source. So potassium is really important. Magnesium also. Magnesium helps moderate and modulate nerve transmission in the brain again. It's amazing the damage that can be done by magnesium deficiency on the brain because like potassium and sodium you need these various minerals in order to have normal brain transmission of neurological impulses. Magnesium as I said earlier is in leafy greens. The reason they're green is because they have magnesium in the chlorophyll molecule. But most fruits and most vegetables will have a lot of magnesium and people that don't eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and eat junk food and processed food lose magnesium. Now white flour, white bread, white rice, white spaghetti, white sugar, processed foods, synthetic foods, they don't tend to have a lot of magnesium. It's all processed right out when they refine grains. So a lot of Americans, it's been shown, are deficient in magnesium. And in its mild state, you might feel irritable and anxious and have low-grade chronic anxiety, and magnesium deficiency produces anxiety. In its worst state, if you're really overtly, seriously deficient in magnesium, you can have grand mal seizures. It can raise blood pressure when you're deficient. So magnesium, potassium, both important for many reasons, but also important for brain health. And they are found in fruits and vegetables, leafy greens, bananas have potassium. All vegetables, all fruits will have potassium and magnesium. Let's review that shopping list. Leafy greens, vegetables like broccoli and potatoes, and fruits like oranges and grapefruits. But Dr. Gonzalez said it's also important for all of those fruits and veggies to be organic mm -hmm. for maximum benefit. Potassium and magnesium, I think my nine trillion brain cells have some new best friends. Two years ago here on Healing Quest, we told you about the grass-fed movement that was delivering meat with unique health benefits. That movement continues to gain strength across the country for nutrition with healthy fats that protect against heart disease and cancer. And our nutritional expert, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, says grass-fed meat is also great brain food mm -hmm. if you're careful about what you buy. What constitutes clean meat? It's got to be grass-fed, pasture-raised. Forget about the feedlot industrial meat. That's a disaster. They raise it on grains. And cows are meant to eat grass. So you want grass-fed eating their normal food that they were designed genetically and metabolically to use effectively, not some junk from a feedlot, some synthetic garbage they're fed because it's cheap up to their knees and their own dung. So grass-fed, pasture-raised. So when you eat meat, it should be fatty. Forget this obsession with lean meat. If you're designed to eat meat, you need meat and you need it with the fat. Well, lean meat tastes terrible. The reason fat's there is first because it's healthy, secondly because it gives taste to the meat. Eating this 90% or 95% lean hamburger, it's like eating sawdust to me. When it's 75%, it's like eating candy. And I always asked to put extra fat in it, and they kind of look at me like I'm nuts. I said, trust me, I want extra fat. In it. They said, it tastes better and it's healthier. And I said, okay, whatever you say. They've gotten to know me now, so they don't question. They said, you're the guy that likes the extra fat. Yeah, I'm the guy that likes the extra fat. When you eat meat, it needs to have the fat. It's there for a reason. The fat's there to help nourish you, provide good energy, and help your brain repair. Again, the saturated fats in grass-fed beef are much different than the saturated fats in the feedlot beef. For example, grass-fed beef have lots of conjugated linoleic acid, which protects against heart disease and protects against cancer. Feedlot-raised animals have very little of that conjugated linoleic acid. So the, the proportions and the amounts and the forms of fatty acids in grass-fed beef are completely different from those from feedlot animals, which is what most Americans eat. So it's got to be grass-fed. Grass-fed will actually help protect your heart because not only does it have conjugate linoleic acid, but there are other unsaturated fats like EPA and DHA, which we associated with fish, but they're also in grass-fed animals. The grass, grass has EPA and DHA in it. The animals eat it, and they get it themselves, and they concentrate it. When I was in practice 20 years ago, and we wanted our patients eating grass-fed beef, we had to search for it, find sources for our patients. It's getting easier to find. You don't have to travel long distances to get grass-fed beef. Uh, a lot of the farmers are turning to grass-fed because they realize there's a market in it. God bless capitalism because now that there's a demand for it, so they're producing it. You know, I was really interested in what Dr. Gonzalez had to say about lean meat. Of course. For years we were told lean meat was the only acceptable meat to eat from a health standpoint. Now, Dr. Gonzalez compared it to sawdust. I, mean, I always thought it tasted more like shoe leather, but you get the point. It turns out that the right kind of meat with the right kind of fat can be great for your brain and your heart and be very tasty too. Cooking a steak just right, of course, is not always easy. So today we have a dynamic duo in the Healing Quest kitchen to share a great recipe with us. Creating our dinner will be Elsa Shaheen, a chef whose resume includes a popular cooking show on TV in her native Mexico. And helping us understand the nutritional and pocketbook benefits of today's recipe will be Laurie Cohen-Peters, a nutrition expert and a certified holistic health practitioner. 
I am so excited to be here today with you and my wonderful friend Elsa, who's just an excellent chef. Thank you, Laurie. Hello. And together we're going to create a beautiful and healthy meal with meat. You know, meat's gotten a bad wrath over the years, and conventional meat has deserved that wrath. As many of you know, industrial raised cattle has horrible properties associated with it, including over proliferation of antibiotics and other chemicals. This is purely grass fed, grass finished beef. And this particular cut is called flat iron. Now, what's interesting about the flat iron is that it's not an expensive piece of meat, but when cooked properly, it actually can have the flavor and the quality of the finest filet. And the truth of the matter is, no matter how much money you're paying for conventional meat, you're not even getting one fourth of the great essential fatty acids and the A's and D's and K's and amino acids that are in this beautiful piece of meat. So Elsa, what's the first step here? Normally, a uh, flat iron steak, you would marinate over a period of hours. We won't do that today because we really want to preserve the flavors of this meat because it, it's so well um, raised. So what we will do, it will, we'll coat it with coconut oil. Coconut oil is incredible. It's got antibacterial qualities to it. It's just a fortified, beautiful oil. Now we're going to use some sea salt. Sea salt has, so, uh, has a much better profile than conventional salt. It hasn't been processed, there's no chlorine bleach added, and it's an excellent source of iodine. And we will also add some pepper. And then, are you gonna use any herbs in this? I was thinking, this is a recipe uh, for my son, actually. My son uh, loves to eat steaks, and he has an herb garden in the back since he was in third grade. So we have a lot of rosemary that's growing very easily and deliciously. So we actually add a little bit to the steak on both sides. And when it is cooking, the flavors of the rosemary infuse the steak really, really well. How long would you say it takes to cook this? Okay, that's a very good question because say we want a medium rare steak. Now these steaks are thick. They're over an inch thick. So typically, I would do five or six minutes per side. Now, I know the pairing of a raw food with a cooked food is a really excellent combination for the digestion. What sauce are you preparing? I know you said you were gonna prepare the raw sauce. Another reason why I chose this sauce, the chimichurri sauce, not just because it is raw, but because it is very rich in flavor, and because the steaks are not marinated, we're going to add that uh, texture and flavor with the sauce. We're going to add some Kalamata olives, as well as some capers, and that'll give it a little bit more of the Mediterranean flavors. Let me flip this over. Okay. And then we'll now add the I rest. I know the chimichurri it normally calls for um, a red wine vinegar, but I actually asked Elsa if it would taste okay with apple cider vinegar. It's actually a healthier vinegar that's raw, as opposed to the cooked or pastured vinegar that it originally called for. And when we pair this beautiful piece of meat with the greens in the parsley, and we use the apple cider vinegar, and soon we're gonna be plating it on this beautiful arugula, which has so much good chlorophyll. So it creates a balanced plate to have a complete and beautiful health-filled meal. Now, because it's a flat iron steak, we will uh, slice it in nice, like one centimeter slices. Okay, let's see, let's get this nice piece here. Oh, look at the beautiful rosemary there. Mm. That's just gorgeous. Okay, and then do you want to put mm. the chimichurri on? That looks yes. so beautiful, it's Elsa. such a beautiful recipe. Okay, um, I'm going to put some of this beautiful red beet salad here to the side. Wow. Oh, wow. So what about this? I, do you think that if you brought this out to your family, they would be happy to partake? I think they'd be impressed. Well, we were certainly impressed. And so was our crew. We all enjoyed sampling the dinner, and Elsa's son liked it a lot as well. Well, a steak like this is an excellent source of the healthy, saturated fats we all need. Now, we have Elsa's recipe for you at the Healing Quest website, and you can also find many other healthy beef recipes in one of our favorite resources, the Nourishing Traditions Cookbook. Also on our website, you'll have information on how you can find grass-fed steak in your area, or connect with an online source We'll ship it right to your door.
Brain health has been a big topic for us this season, and so every week we've been passing along expert advice on the best ways to nourish our brain. Now the tip we have today is one I suspect most of us have never heard about, but nutritional expert Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez said it's something we should all have in our diet every day. Coconut oil was demonized by the academic authorities and the medical authorities in Washington. It's horrible. It's got saturated fat. There was this hysteria for 50 years about saturated fat. Fortunately, it's finally being over, is overturned. There's no question that coconut oil helps with brain function. It has a group of, a, of a really important saturated fatty acids that help the brain function better. You know, the brain is 60% fat, and a lot of it is saturated fat. The idea that saturated fats are the enemy of mankind like salt is wrong. The brain needs saturated fat in order to function. Neurotransmission cannot, cannot occur without saturated fats. The myelin sheath around the axons that allows neurotransmission to occur so efficiently and effectively is made up largely of saturated fat. And coconut oil has the exact combination there are dozens and dozens of saturated fats. Coconut oil has the exact combination, the right proportions that the brain thrives on. So coconut oil is wonderful. There was a study about a couple of years ago where they gave four to eight tablespoons of coconut oil, which admittedly is a lot of coconut oil, to patients with overt, properly diagnosed Alzheimer's. And there was substantial improvement in their memory, cognition, recognition, all the subtle and not so subtle uh, tests of memory that really helped enormously. So coconut oil, anybody who wants to save their brain should take coconut oil. If you're not interested in saving your brain, please don't take coconut oil. It's literally more so than fish, which was a traditional brain food. Coconut oil is really legitimately, scientifically proven brain food. Um, and for normal preventative reasons, a tablespoon or two a day, I take a tablespoon a day. I read a recent study six weeks ago that found that a couple tablespoons of coconut oil within 24 hours improve cognitive ability and memory. It's, the effect is that fast because the brain can repair very quickly even after years of damage and abuse. So coconut oil is one of those really remarkable supplements that has a lot of scientific data behind it to support its use with, with any kind of brain malfunction or, or misfortune. It really helps enormously. So that's something that should be part of everybody's program. Again, unless you're not interested in maintaining your intellectual capabilities, please don't take coconut oil. Well, I think most of us would want to do that, so I asked him how we can make coconut oil part of our daily diet. Dr. Gonzalez said he uses it, now just one tablespoon a day, on green salads instead of olive oil, on warm vegetables like broccoli where it melts like butter. He also recommends coconut oil on a baked potato, and if a healthy shake is part of your day, you can also add it there. Now, Dr. Gonzalez said it's important to make sure the coconut oil is organic, unprocessed, and non-GMO. And the Nourishing Traditions Cookbook, which is one of our favorites, mm -hmm. has many more coconut oil recipe suggestions. That's our healing quest for now. Please remember you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And join us next time right here on Healing Quest.